Welcome to our teacher enrichment program, Virtual Bride of Science. We're super excited to have all of you here today. The theme for our webinar today is Slam Dunk, How is STEM Useful in Sports? A little bit about the history behind the Center for Excellence in Education. It was founded in 1983 by Joanne De Janeiro and Admiral Rickover, the father of nuclear Navy and civilian uses of nuclear power with the mission to nurture high school and university scholars to careers of excellence and leadership in STEM. There's four programs here at the CEE the Research Science Institute, USA Biolympiad, the Teacher Enrichment Program, and STEM Lyceum. I'm gonna dive deep into each of these and explain all of them to you guys. So we have our RSI, our Research Science Institute. It's a highly competitive six-week summer science and engineering program open to rising high school seniors. Juniors are eligible to apply, but seniors are not. RSI is the first cost-free summer science and engineering program that combines on-campus coursework and scientific theory with off-campus coursework in science and technology research. We also have our USA Biolympiad, otherwise known as USABO. It is the premier biology competition for high school students in the United States, and it provides them motivation, curricular resources, and skills training to take them beyond their classroom experience to the level of international competitiveness. So USABO is a program that after two rounds of challenging exams, about 20 finalists from thousands of students are chosen to move on to the finals where four students earn the right to represent the U.S. in the International Biology Olympiad. And a fun fact about CEE is that since, we've been, since we began administering the USAPO in 2003, every member of the USAPO team has been medaled in IPO. Our teacher enrichment program provides opportunities for middle and high school teachers to connect with leading experts from industry and academia, explore cutting edge research and development, and make meaningful professional links with direct benefits for you and your students. And finally, we have our newest program here at CEE, our STEM Lyceums program. It's our newest initiative here, and it's a virtual club for high school students to engage in discussions and exploration of STEM and the concepts of career pathways. So getting into it, we are excited to have two of our speakers here. First, we have Maya Ganeshan, our Global Strategy and Innovation Manager for the National Basketball Association. And then we have Aaron Barzilai, founder of Hoopstats and former director of basketball analytics for the Philadelphia 76ers. I'm super excited to have them talk today, and I hope that you guys take something away from their journeys. And I will pass it over to Maya. Well, thank you all so much for having me, and uh, thank you, Adiola, for the for the great tip-off. I'm very excited to be speaking to all of you today. What I wanted to do today is, is share a little bit about my journey. I'm an alum of um, the Research Science Institute program that um, Adiola just talked about. So um, we'll talk a little bit about kind of my journey through STEM education, including my time um, in that program, and then hopefully we'll get a chance uh, to kind of talk a little bit about the question that you probably all have on your minds, which is how on earth do you end up working in sports if you start out, um, you know, doing science, uh, a science research summer program. So we'll cover all of that. And then if there are any questions, I know we have time for questions um, after both Aaron and I get a chance to speak. So. Just to start, I grew up in a family of engineers just outside of Seattle. So both my parents were software engineers. My older sister had this natural aptitude for math and for the sciences. And while I liked math a lot, and I was just a very curious person. I would say I am still a very curious person to the point where some of my friends call me nosy. But I, but I always had that level of curiosity since I was a child. But Despite all that, I never really saw myself going into a STEM field. I naturally gravitated more towards the arts. And so I, you know, loved things like abstract art or music or poetry. I would go outside just to like stand outside and stare at the sky, right? Like I sort of saw myself as this very dreamy, impulsive, forgetful, scatterbrained kid. And in my mind, those are all things that were fundamentally incompatible with being a, being a scientist or an engineer. I just didn't think that, that, that those were things that, or words that you could use to describe somebody who worked um, in a STEM field. But fate had another idea for me, and it came in the form of this high school, which was a brand new high school that opened in my school district right when I was entering high school. I, you know, the, I was sort of drawn by the idea of this school because it was pitched as a small class size high school. The principal had, who was helping start the school, had poached the best science and math teachers from across the district and put them all in one building, which I found 
exciting and, and it certainly piqued my interest. I was also drawn by obviously the opportunity to um, be in a small classroom experience. So the fact that every graduating class was about 150 students was really exciting to me because I thought I could get to know my teachers a lot better. And then going back to the point about curiosity, I was just really excited to learn a little bit more about fields of study that I hadn't really explored before. All throughout my elementary school experience and my middle school experience, I meet, whether it was because of natural aptitude or just, you know, whatever the school's focused on, I felt like I'd grown a lot in my skills around the humanities. So I felt like I'd become a better writer and I knew a lot of, you know, stuff about history and social studies, but I never really felt like I had that much of a grounding in the STEM fields. And so that was also something that seemed really interesting um, as an opportunity to just explore those areas of study a little bit more. It was at this school that I found a true love of the sciences and engineering and math. I loved classes like calculus, which I know is surprising to a lot of people um, when they hear that, that was my favorite class in high school. I loved classes like chemistry. I loved you know, even classes like biology that were very memorization heavy, which again, going back to the forgetful dreamy personality did not seem to necessarily jive with my natural strength. Um, and even in classes where I struggled like physics, I still really enjoyed them because I felt like they made the world seem more complex and more interesting. And there was just so many new layers to the world that I had never really thought about before. But even despite all of that, I wanna tell you a story about one teacher at the school who completely changed my life. His name was Mike Town. Um, he taught environmental science at my high school and he was something of a legend in our school district. He had been given NEA educator awards. He had been recognized by President Bush. He had testified in front of Congress to get over 100,000 acres of uh, forest added to federally protected lands. Um, and he was just honestly one of the most passionate people and passionate educators I've ever had the fortune to meet. Um, he and his wife had even built their own house that was so beyond carbon neutral um, that they would be giving back power to the power grid and the power company would be paying them for the extra capacity that they were giving to the grid. Um, he would tell us stories about that and he would tell us stories about driving to school in his electric car. And right now, if someone told you all of that, it wouldn't seem that far-fetched, but in the early 2010s, all of that just seemed like this incredible fantasy um, that nobody could imagine was real, but we were all so inspired by. It. Well, basically, I want to tell you that this teacher changed my life. And from his class, I developed this deep and abiding love of the environment that shapes my core values and every single decision that I make to this day. He was so inspiring, in fact, that he motivated one of my classmates and I to reach out to an environmental science professor at the local university. We asked him if we could just learn a little bit more about what it meant to do research in this area, if we could participate or support anything that they were doing in some small way, and he was generous enough to say yes. And so it was there that I learned how a real lab worked, um, learned how to work with satellite data sets, um, and started to do analysis on large sets of satellite data that his lab had collected. Um, in our project that my friend and I did together, um, we studied the effect of wildfires on air pollution um, in Washington State, where I'm from, um, and we got to present our work, actually very excitingly, um, to the governor of Washington um, when he came to visit our high school. The following summer, um, I was lucky enough to be a part of the Research Science Institute program that Adiola mentioned. Um, and so just to reiterate a little bit, the RSI program brings together 80 students from around the world to the Boston area for a summer. The idea is that these students all come together um, to work with scientists and work at labs in and around the Boston area, just given the glut of incredible universities um, out there. And I was lucky enough to be placed with a researcher at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Sounds a little bit intimidating when you first think about it, um, but I was actually placed in, in the atmospheric science research group um, within that um, broader lab, um, just following up on some of the work that I had already done um, in the sort of air pollution uh, atmospheric science space. 
What I was most curious about in my research was if you could pinpoint increases in airborne pollutants above sites that we knew would be contributing to that pollution. And in particular, I was really interested in knowing if you could pinpoint increases in harmful airborne pollutants above oil and natural gas sites. So sites where we knew and continue to know um, that there are a significant number of those chemicals being released into the air. Um, the highlight of this program for me was obviously getting to do all this research and, and put it together and, and try to pull some insights out of it. But at the end of the summer, as you'll see in this picture in the upper right hand corner, um, all of us got to present our findings to a room full of scientists from those incredible universities in the Boston area, um, which just felt like, you know, sort of the pinnacle of, of everything I could have worked for that summer. Um, it was just a real honor to be able to share my work um, and answer questions about this thing that I felt so passionately about. If it is of any interest, um, I will say what I learned that summer above all else was that satellite data sets are quite noisy. Um, and it's a little challenging to, to necessarily draw any correlations there when you're dealing with things like weather patterns and other human activity. So alas, did not necessarily find um, the results I was hoping for, but the whole experience was so transformative and so inspiring for me um, as, as kind of motivation for what I wanted to do going forward. In college, I wanted to stay on this path, um, but I also found that I wanted to study basically everything under the sun. Um, and so I wanted to be an earth science major and continue this work, but I also wanted to be an English major. And I also wanted to be, you know, a chemistry major. I had so many different goals um, for myself and could see myself being happy in a lot of different spaces. Um, and so I ended up picking what I felt was kind of the, the sweet spot um, amongst all of my varied interests, which to me was economics. Um, and it, in, in kind of continuing with a theme that, that I've touched on so far, I was really inspired by the opportunity to study econ, um, primarily because it continued to answer two questions that I had pretty much been asking my whole life, which were why and how. So I loved that my econ um, coursework allowed me to continue to explore how the world works, why it works the way it does, and what we can do to make it a better place. And lest you think I had forgotten my roots in any capacity, um, every single time I had to write a paper in one of my econ classes, I always wrote about the environment um, to the point where some of my friends would make fun of me and they would always say, we know exactly what you're going to write your what you're going to write your paper about um, because every single time I talked about something relating to the economics of, um, of sustainability or um, environmental work. Um, and my senior thesis, in fact, um, was about identifying the public health impacts of Superfund sites, um, which are incredibly toxic waste sites across the country, often the result of um, you know, government research or um, chemical spills or um, kind of private sector um, manufacturing and other things like that. So I, I was studying the public health impacts of these sites um, to evaluate whether the cost that is associated with cleaning up these sites is actually producing um, the impacts that we hope it will. Now, you might look at all of this that I've just talked about so far, and you're going, well, that's great. Um, but how on earth do you explain the fact that you went from all of this to doing corporate strategy at the National Basketball Association? It's a great question. Um, and so I will now draw you the map from point A to point B. Um, so coming out of college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I looked around at what other people were doing um, who had recently graduated from the economics department. And I knew that I didn't want to be a banker. I didn't want to do like a PhD in economics. Um, I know some, some folks had gone on to be researchers and I didn't want to do that either. Um, all I knew is that I wanted to do something that felt very tangible. And I wanted to feel like I was helping people and I was making things happen. So out of college for about two years, um, I ended up working at a management consulting firm. And everyone there had come from a range of backgrounds. So in my analyst class alone, we had film majors, we had mechanical engineering majors, we had government majors, we had, we had econ majors like me. Um, and I would even meet people who had done 
who had completed medical school or had done PhDs in incredibly difficult things like nuclear physics or biomedical engineering, and they had all made the pivot to consulting. So what I learned from that experience, in addition to the opportunity to work on really interesting projects and work with great and smart people, was that this was not an uncommon path. Um, the one that I was charting was kind of doing that transition from STEM fields or STEM background to something a little bit more um, corporate, shall I say. It was also just it turned out to be a catch all for anybody who wanted to work in corporate America. Um, and in my case, that proved to be a really catalytic experience for me, um, learning that there was a future for people who were just smart and thoughtful and wanted to kind of use their brain power on interesting problems um, in any field. Two years after I started that job, um, I decided in the middle of the pandemic, just given a lot of um, factors around remote work and, and all those challenges, um, that I wanted to make a change. And I ended up working um, and interviewing for and, and taking on a job at the National Basketball Association, which is where I work today. Both the job that I had in management consulting and the job that I have today are remarkably similar um, in their roles and responsibilities. And on a day-to-day -day basis, my job is basically to manage and execute projects. So that can look very different depending on the day, but it usually boils down to four key tasks that I might be doing on any given day. The first one is having this deep level of expertise on all my projects so I can monitor what has been done, um, what we need to do next, and any issues that might arise. The second uh, kind of area of work is um, creating PowerPoint decks, memos, talking points, or any other materials that are needed to convey my project, its status, whatever the roadblock is, whatever, uh, whatever we need to communicate at the time to senior executives or key stakeholders. The third one is pulling together and analyzing data to create the business case for our project or support any interim decisions um, that need to be made along the way. And then the fourth one is making sure that we have thought through all of the appropriate considerations, possibilities, next steps, implications, et cetera, of the work that we're doing. Again, you might hear all of this and think this sounds like a lot of what are typically called kind of quote unquote soft skills. Um, and you might be wondering what all of this has to do with STEM and how a STEM education can be helpful in this context. But the truth is that my STEM education has actually underpinned every single one of these uh, roles that I have performed, and it has made me capable and better at doing every facet of my job. Let me explain. Starting with the first two of these tasks, I remember being in elementary school and having to do science fair projects. Um, and you have this sort of three piece board and on your board you have you know, your question, your hypothesis, the step-by-step -step procedure, a summary of your findings and like a next steps or, or what, what has the so what of your project. And I remember my teachers having us do this exercise in class where we would have to write like a simple procedure for some experiment. And then we'd have to like pass it around among our cl classmates and everybody would have to try to replicate the experiment that we had written. And it was a real lesson in how to communicate effectively and especially how to communicate to people who don't know anything about the work that you've done. Um, doing science fairs as a kid and doing those kinds of exercises in the classroom really made me take a step back and stop and think about how to communicate effectively to people who had no prior knowledge of my work. I was, I was always thinking about, okay, how can I get them up to speed quickly? What's most important to communicate about my work? And because I had done this experiment, what were the implications? What other experiments could I now do? I'm sure you all remember doing some version of this as kids. I certainly remember doing many, many of these. And I genuinely believe that those skills are the same skills that I use today in my job. If someone came up to me at a science fair and asked me to explain my project to them, I needed to have the two minute pitch, right? The, the quick overview of what I do. I needed to have that deep level of expertise on what I had done to be able to communicate it to other people. I do the same thing today. And instead of 
people who are coming up to my science fair board, it's it's executives in meetings. And instead of my three piece board with pieces of paper printed out and glued on it, now it's PowerPoint decks or memos. To go on to number three, um, in my current job, one of the things that I'm working on or one of the projects I'm actively working on um, is building and manipulating large financial models um, that represent the NBA's financials. So for example, um, the NBA is currently negotiating a new collective bargaining agreement with our players union. Um, this is the agreement that actually allows our business to function and we renegotiate it about every six to seven years. So it covers everything from revenue sharing agreements with the players to how many media appearances the players have to play to how many games they need to play in order to be eligible for certain bonuses. And my role is to support the ongoing negotiation process between the league office where I work and the players union. So as we go back and forth on negotiating a deal, my job is to take those proposals or those counter proposals and build them into the NBA financial models to see the long term impact to the health of our business. But if you ask me why I feel confident doing things like that, I will point you to the very beginning of my Excel modeling work, which was looking at satellite data sets. And of course, since I was 16 years old, I've picked up many, many more skills in Excel and the work that I'm doing is much more complex. And now I'm dealing with multi-billion dollar business, you know, financial models, as opposed to a, a smaller set of data points that I'm just doing research on for my own interest. But the crux of the work is still similar. I'm still sifting through a, a bunch of data, pulling out what's noisy and what's actually useful and trying to extract meaningful insights from a large data set. When I was doing all my scientific research, I'd have to figure out how to use that data to tell a story and then put together presentations or papers to communicate that to, to other people. That is still the heart of what I do today. And let me tell you a story about number four. In the RSI summer program, we had a weekly voluntary activity that was called Journal Club. It involved each member of the group who had volunteered to be there, um, bringing in a scientific paper from whatever field of study they were working on for their summer research project. So most of the people who were listening to this uh, presentation of this paper didn't really have much background in the field that was being discussed. And so if you were the one who was coming up and presenting this paper about your field, you would get loads of questions from the group because everybody was genuinely curious and didn't know a whole lot about the field in question. Sometimes in order to be able to answer the questions that you got, you'd even have to read all the footnotes, you'd have to read every single kind of margin um, and make sure that you knew this other person's research that had gotten published somewhere inside and out. And that was the magic of it, is that as a presenter and as a participant, it really taught me what good questions looked like and how to ask good questions and how to be thoughtful in making sure that the information that gets presented to you is not the whole story, right? There's often, you need to often probe a little bit deeper to really get, make sure you have your hands completely around what's being discussed. That's very similar to, to the work I do today. It's my job in my current role to ask as many thoughtful questions as I can to make sure that we've left no stone unturned and to make sure that we're considering all the possibilities and implications of our work. Now, I work in sports because I love sports. I care deeply about the work I do. I feel like I'm genuinely making the world a better place. Um, I even get a little bit teary eyed when I walk past people playing basketball um, on courts around New York City where I live and I see people wearing NBA branded clothing or trying to you know, replicate the moves of their favorite players. Um, it sounds a little bit cheesy, but it, it, it certainly moves me every single time because I know that I'm playing some small part in helping create this thing that is an escape and such a source of joy to so many people. But I'm very aware that the reason I'm able to work in sports and the reason that I'm able to do my job, I owe a lot of it to my STEM education. And it goes all the way back to elementary school and continues through middle school and high school and, and my college experience. Every single educational experience I've had in the STEM arena has encouraged me to ask why and how. And those two questions have carried me throughout my whole life and continue to underpin the work that I do today. So, in closing, I wanna bring this all back to the reason we're here today, which is all of you, teachers. 
Teachers have made the biggest difference in my life and have shaped every facet of who I am. Going to that STEM high school changed my life. And sure, I didn't end up working in a STEM field, but I think that's the really brilliant thing about STEM education. The basic tenets of it are things like critical thinking, questioning, clear and effective communication, and most importantly, a lifelong quest of curiosity and learning. And those things are valuable in every single aspect of life. Your students may not end up curing cancer or coming up with the most cost-effective carbon capture technology, although I, I really hope they do because that would be great for all of us. Um, but regardless of whether they end up working in a STEM field or not, we need brilliant and thoughtful and curious people in every single field. Um, and that is the greatest gift that you can leave them with, is to, be, to help them become people who always ask how and why. So regardless of whether your students end up working in STEM fields or not, um, you are teaching them to be more curious people and more thoughtful citizens of the world. So thank you so much for all that you do. You all are truly amazing. It's an honor to be here with you today and thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Maya, that was amazing. And now we're gonna transition over to Aaron. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, Adila. And uh, yes, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, I haven't had the pleasure to uh, meet you in person uh, previously. Um, I too attended the Research Science Institute. Uh, it was a few years earlier than Maya. I was in the uh, class of uh, 1988. Um, you know, I've always been a person that's loved math. Uh, loved science and also loved uh, sports. Um, one of the perks actually of being on campus in 1988, we were on the campus of Georgetown. Um, and so the uh, men's Olympic basketball team was actually sort of in training camp there and we would occasionally bump into them uh, randomly across uh, campus. Um, I have a much lighter presentation uh, than my, um, but uh, I wanted to just spend a little bit of time kind of introducing myself and um, talking a little bit about my perspective, my experiences, what I've seen uh, over the course of my journey. And then most importantly, I wanted to open it up to questions because you know, I often find that's kind of the most uh, interesting uh, part to folks uh, who are kind of attending um, a session like this. So uh, for me, you know, as again, I always loved basketball, played a little bit in high school. Um, I went to MIT uh, undergrad after I attended uh, RSI, and I was on the basketball team there. The Division Three program wasn't very good. Um, I like to say I practiced uh, more than I played, but you know, you got if you're gonna play basketball two hours a day for four years, you end up getting uh, a little bit better. And so um, that was really a fun journey. Um, I thought I wanted to be a professor, uh, and so I went to grad school out at Stanford, uh, which was an exciting time. I was there in the sort of late '90s. And um, I, I actually studied mechanical <clears throat> engineering. And I think uh, an important theme for kind of my experience is that I did not map it out at all. Um, you know, when I graduated, uh, Moneyball like, hadn't been written, let alone the movie. Um, you know, there really wasn't uh, a lot of room in uh, professional sports, I think, for people that specialize in, in, in kind of math and science aside from, you know, the statisticians. Uh, that were kind of working the games. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I, said, I didn't really have a plan, but for me, what always motivated me was really just kind of working on uh, interesting problems. Uh, and so uh, after I, by the time I graduated, I realized with my PhD, I realized that, um, you know, I wasn't as interested in the academic life as I thought that I would be uh, when I was first starting out. I decided that, you know, I found that, you know, it was hard to get my entire um, thesis committee to even care about my thesis. Uh, and so I thought it would be more exciting to go into um, the uh, kind of professional world working in industry. Um, and so I worked uh, at a couple of different jobs um, doing sort of software development, kind of business analytics, data analytics. Um, at the same time, actually, my wife um, started in uh, Teach for America uh, in DC. And so she's been a high school physics teacher for the last, you know, 20 plus years. So uh, I definitely, uh, as you can imagine, have heard uh, a lot of the stories, both the uh, trials and tribulations, the joys and the pain of being a teacher, have a lot of um, kind of appreciation for all that you face and really the range of students, you know, the challenges in motivating them, uh, the challenges in dealing with them, dealing with their parents. So, um, you know, it can be uh, definitely an interesting uh, situation. Uh, so yes, I really appreciate kind of all the time I know that you 
uh, pour into your jobs uh, if you're anything like my wife. And so, um, but yeah, as I said, I really just tried to follow along. I uh, was working for a while in, I guess, traditional industry. Then I actually went and um, started working in management consulting as well. I live um, in sort of like outside of Princeton, New Jersey. So I'm about halfway between uh, Philadelphia and New York. And uh, about the time that uh, I started doing that, um, I also, that's really when I first found out that basketball analytics was a thing. Um, you know, I definitely can distinctly remember the moment. It was, I was reading the uh, Sports Illustrated uh, season preview for that issue for basketball. Um, and uh, the great Chris Ballard uh, had written an article about three people that were kind of starting to do, bring money ball to basketball. And as I read the profile of them, you know, I thought like, hey, like I might not have a chance to be, uh, you know, better than these people at the job, but I thought I could be sort of vaguely in the same ballpark as someone that had, you know, played, uh, you know, quote unquote, played in college, uh, you know, and had a, had a PhD. Uh, and so I did something which I think, um, you know, is really an important thing uh, for people that want to work in sports was I started doing uh, sort of public projects. I started a website um, where I was tracking plus minus data for the NBA. This was before um, plus minus was a stat that you could see uh, in the NBA box scores. And so I would basically get up, you know, I'd work at night, I'd get up in the morning, kind of process, uh, you know, scrape the games off the NBA.com website. Uh, I had to do a lot of data cleaning and then um, upload sort of the data uh, and put that data out in sort of near real time. And, you know, I think another thing, which is always to me a theme that I try to emphasize to uh, people that are interested in getting into sports is that like whatever you're doing, you have to just really enjoy it in the moment. You know, again, at that time, kind of working professionally in basketball was like the part of this thing from my mind. You know, again, I didn't have a tremendous concept that it could happen. Uh, and I knew even if it did, that it would be pretty challenging. And so, but I just enjoyed what I was doing. You know, uh, I happened to get into kind of basketball analytics just as it was started going on. Um, you know, there's a big conference every year in Boston that's run by the MIT Sloan School of Management. And I happened to go to the very first one, uh, coincidentally, because that was kind of when my interest was peaked. Um, and so, you know, I started to meet people and it was just kind of really, um, great to sort of learn from kind of the broader community. This was even before Twitter. So there were folks that were like on message boards and stuff talking, you know, giving feedback slash critiquing everybody's work. Um, and so you could kind of learn and, and kind of grow from that feedback and kind of learn how to uh, improve. And then also it was a good opportunity to kind of sort of build your resume and make a name for yourself. Um, and so I was doing that work kind of just independently um, and then I started to sort of realize, hey, maybe there is a chance, you know, I could sort of see that there were, um, you know, a few people had gotten hired that I sort of thought of as my peers. And, you know, I could tell there were a few people that if I was a team, I would have hired uh, before me. But, you know, at that point, there were probably only six or seven teams that had hired someone. And I, I didn't think there were 23 and there are 30 NBA teams. I had a I figured if the world uh, moved to a place where every team hired someone, I had a decent chance at, um, you, you know, maybe potentially working at a team. So at that point, it really did, I'd say, become a, a bit of a, of a dream of mine. But it was a long journey. It's probably about eight years from the time when I first started doing public work. Uh, it's when I had a full-time job working with the, the 76ers. Uh, for four years before that, I was working sort of part-time for the Memphis Grizzlies as their analytics person. Um, you know, at that point, we were probably the somewhere around the 13th to 15th team to have someone. So it definitely felt like we were uh, pretty early. Um, and then one thing that's kind of really interesting is, you know, when I started working with teams, let alone when I was in college, um, the concept of, you know, data science, which you hear a lot in the news now, uh, a lot of discussion on, like, it didn't really exist. Like, you couldn't have taken classes in that. And so I think another theme that's really, um, you know, a valuable skill that I always kind of encourage people um, if they're trying to get, get into teams. It's really about being a lifelong learner and really um, learning to adapt, right? And, you know, because even like the techniques in, you know, a field like data science have been, um, you know, evolving incredibly rapidly. You know, most notably when I started working on NBA data, really the only data that was available was uh, the play-by-play -play data that you can see, you know, um, 
Steph Curry hits a three pointer and then, you know, uh, you know, Kevin Durant makes a two pointer like 20 seconds later. And so, you know, there's only about 400 to 500 records like that in a game. Um, it's really not that many shots. And so, but over time, the uh, technology has evolved and now we have this tracking data that you'll see, you know, in lots of sports if you're watching you know, on TV where they're able to, you know, something like 25 frames a second, um, sort of identify where all the players and the ball are. And I think that technology is just going to get more and more uh, advanced. Um, and then we're going to start to get sort of the virtual skeletons um, that you, you get in other kind of situations that, you know, they're using like movies and whatnot. Um, and so I think being able to kind of keep up with that evolve, you know, uh, you know, a career is a very long time. Um, and so, you know, not just kind of learning the material that's in front of you today, but sort of being comfortable taking on new, taking in new information and developing your skills, I think is essential. Um, so uh, again, I worked for the, the, the Memphis Grizzlies for about four years, um, sort of a consulting kind of role. Then I was with the uh, Philadelphia 76ers for about two. You know, I think another thing that I often caution people is that uh, sports is a very volatile business, right? If you follow it closely, um, you know, very often you'll see people, whether it's a general manager or a head coach gets fired and like everybody on staff um, turns over, you know, they want to bring in their own people and so that. Um, you know, happened to me. And then, you know, really I had to adapt. And so I started off focusing on doing a little bit of independent consulting. Uh, you know, I actually did a little work for the legal office. Uh, and I also worked a little bit for agents and for teams, um, did a media project. I think that's one other thing that I really like to emphasize to people. You know, I think a lot of people that are interested in working in sports, like the only job they can imagine is uh, like being the general manager of a, of a professional team. And there's really so many opportunities to work in sports. If you really love a sport, there's tons of opportunity uh, and, and tons of need. And so, you know, I'll encourage young people like, hey, think about working at your local minor league team, right? Like there aren't that many people, you know, a lot more people are applying for jobs, uh, you know, with the Boston Celtics than the main Red Claws or something like that, right? Um, you know, think of all the minor league baseball that's happening. It's a lot um, easier. You know, they're not, the people that are not running a AAA team, um, you know, they don't have much budget, but they're also not getting that many resumes, you know, in contrast to, uh, you know, say the Atlanta Braves or something like that. So I think it's important to kind of find, you know, all kinds of opportunities and not just kind of limit yourself to that and just kind of being open to the experience. I think gaining that experience, building your network ends up being really important. Uh, to work in sports, just getting to kind of know people and, and also just learning from them, right? It can be very isolating if you're, um, you know, just spending all your time kind of running the numbers uh, on your computer or your desk or something like that. So um, over time, um, you know, consulting uh, was fun, but it was also a challenge, right? Finding clients. And curiously enough, uh, I had just wrapped up a media project uh, and a friend of mine who used to work uh, with me at the Philadelphia 76ers, he was a, um, you know, your classic kind of intern in college who would, you know, fill the fridge and restock the coffee. And, uh, you know, he couldn't drive, he, they wouldn't let him drive the, you know, lottery, NBA lottery prospects uh, to the airport, but he could pick up the people that were going to be undrafted uh, and bring them to the workouts. And so he got a job working with the uh, Tennessee Lady Volunteers. Um, you know, in the NCAA, and he said, hey, Aaron, like, I'm used to having access to all this kind of information working in, uh, on the men's side, you know, are there any stats site that you can recommend uh, on the, for the women's game? And so I had recalled Sue Bird had written an article once sort of uh, complaining about the lack of information, but I was really surprised to see that no one had answered the call. And as I said, I just had finished up a project. And so, um, you know, I uh, basically said, um, you know, why not start for all intents and purposes the first kind of women's basketball, uh, reliable women's basketball stat sites out there. Um, you know, again, because I'm familiar with the people in the basketball community, you know, um, have lots of kind of friends that run sort of analogous sites on the men's side. So, you know, it seemed realistic. That's kind of one of the benefits, right, of, of knowing a lot of people and, and kind of knowing what work is out there. And so I launched Her Hoop Stats five years ago in 2017. Um, and, you know, we first started out as a stat site, but, you know, very quickly, again, we had to adapt and realize that there's, you know, a need, uh, so many like untold stories. And so we added a journalism component uh, as well, right? So we have articles, we have podcasts, sort of video content. Um, and, you know, we added a sort of recommended betting picks uh, this year. And so there's just really 
kind of um, you know huge need for kind of the coverage uh, of women's basketball addition to men's. <laughs> and so I've been doing that for the last five years while also kind of doing consulting work. And then most recently, I uh, joined a uh, new startup company. It's actually funded by the uh, owners of the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Minnesota Lynx, so the WNBA. Um, uh, Mark Laurie and actually Alex Rodriguez Arod are the, the two uh, kind of founders. And um, it's an athlete stock market. And so uh, it's a really interesting uh, problem where we're basically saying like, hey, I'd buy stock in you know, Brock Purdy, if you've been watching the NFL, or I'd buy stock in Steph Curry or, you know, Walker Kessler as a, as a rookie that's been surprising people in the NBA this year, um, and sort of letting people sort of effectively kind of bet on the, the long-term future of these players. And so, you know, for all of that, you know, I think that working in sports to me, I think, and especially having an opportunity to work at a team, you know, it's a really hard thing. There just aren't that many jobs uh, and, you know, you, you wanted to sort of point yourself to become, you know, kind of running a team in, in the future, right? Like the chances that's going to happen are, are is relatively low. That's why I think it's important to kind of enjoy every step along the way and also recognize, um, you know, all the kind of fun opportunities there are uh, sort of in that path um, because you never know how it's going to play out. And really, you know, it takes a combination. I think obviously it takes talent. You have to be uh, you know, have a lot of skills and, and continue uh, to kind of grow your skills. Um, it takes a ton of hard work. It's incredibly competitive. There's, you know, lots of people in the world uh, that want to want to work uh, in sports. And so it can be really hard uh, to compete with that. I've heard stories of, you know, you know, former NBA players kind of offering work for free. And so it's like really hard to interview for a job where you'd like to have a paid salary. The supply and demand is totally out of whack. But then the other thing I would encourage people is it takes a ton of luck. I know a ton of very talented people um, that um, work very hard, but for whatever reason, it just hasn't worked out. And it's really not a commentary on them. It has to do, you know, with kind of, sometimes it's kind of who you know, sometimes it's timing isn't right. Sometimes, um, you know, there's just an incredible number of talented candidates and many of them could do the job. And, you know, it can be really hard when you're interviewing to really know at a super high level who's going to, um, you know, be the best. If it was, you know, the NBA draft uh, seems to draft perfectly every year, right? And so you can only imagine the challenge when there's less um, concrete measurements uh, of a person's performance. And so that's, you know, for all those reasons, I think that's why it's really important to um, really just kind of make sure you enjoy it and have the passion. Because like, if you have the passion for whatever you're working on, right, you're going to be um, excited to work on it. You're going to kind of lay away at night, wake at night thinking about it, excited to stay up late working on it. Um, you know, and that's really kind of uh, pretty important. So, you know, that's a little bit about my journey and also what I'm doing now. You know, a couple of things I did want to mention before kind of opening up the questions is, you know, one thing I had suggested was talking about really kind of what STEM skills I'm using today. And again, really, I think, you know, you do need to know the fundamentals of kind of the math and the science. But, you know, often it's really not that um, difficult, uh, the actual math. It's usually like simple algebra, you know, on the baseball side, if you think of, you know, on base percentage, right? It's, you know, basically let's take batting average, but like maybe we should not ignore the walks. So you add the number of walks to the numerator, the denominator, and suddenly have a kind of a more advanced stats. You know, in basketball, there's similar statistics. It's like the math to kind of account for the value of a three-pointer is really not that hard. But, you know, a lot of people in the world still pay attention to field goal percentage. And so if you're looking at stats that kind of adjust field goal percentage for uh, how many threes versus how many twos you're taking, you're kind of got a little bit of a leg up there. Um, so really, sometimes the, the math is not that hard. And also teams, <laughs> uh, one thing that I have definitely seen, I don't know if I can speak to this, the NBA, uh, a league office, but when teams are kind of making these decisions publicly, and you see this surprising draft pick and it works out or it doesn't, or, you know, a trade works out, you know, there's often not a lot of detail about the work that went into it. And it's pretty amazing how some people that are kind of very highly respected um, for being smart are doing very kind of back of the envelope calculations and, and rankings on the whiteboards in their offices. Um, you know, it's really not always about having kind of incredibly complex math, right? It's really a lot about problem solving. It's really about framing the approach and thinking about what you're trying to solve and kind of being really kind of smart about how to 
go about it or figure out if this is a hard problem with like a very similar easy problem that I do know how to solve. And then really it's also about communicating it. I remember when I was with the Memphis Grizzlies, um, I was speaking in a panel kind of like this. And one thing I said, like, I did not think it was sort of important for me to have like the best NBA draft model of any kind of analyst working for a team. I thought my value to the organization would be much higher if I could just get the whole organization kind of a little um, more familiar with uh, sort of the kind of entry level basic stats. And instead of looking at stats like just points per game to kind of how, how they ranked players, um, to think about it um, both, um, you know, converting it to a per minute uh, kind of stat and then a per possession stat, which is kind of per opportunity. And again, the math on that's very simple, but just sort of the organizational change of kind of getting people to use slightly better measurements um, for kind of evaluating players, I thought would be infinitely more valuable. Um, you know, so many teams, you know, I've, I've, I've met people that have had lots of different experiences. Sometimes, you know, um, they're doing great work, but like they're like literally working in the basement and no one really cares. And so like, what's really the value of, you know, again, having the best NBA draft model if no one's gonna look at it, um, you know, on the night of the NBA draft. So being able to kind of communicate and kind of build that consensus is really important. Um, and again, I think that ties into kind of what I said before. And so I'll wrap it up with this again. I think if you have students that are interested in working in sports analytics, there's a tremendous amount of public work out there. There's a huge uh, community on places like NBA Twitter, you know, I would encourage them re, you know, identify um, journalists, you know, in the NBA, for instance, Kevin Pelton uh, is a great one, but, you know, for different sports, you can identify the folks that are doing kind of very interesting um, kind of analytics work and just read everything that they're doing, kind of learn what they're talking about, get kind of the lay of the land, and then, you know, start to figure out how you can do work on your own. It's easier than ever to start a blog or a newsletter or just post results um, on Twitter. And if you do that, people are going to notice. I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone, they do interesting work for like six months and then suddenly a, a team or something will snap them up. But definitely the people that are out there and kind of demonstrating it, um, you know, it really does make a difference. And especially if, you know, someone's a high school student now and starting to do it, um, in, you know, in college as well, right? Intern Again, interning at like a minor league baseball team or the equivalent of that, or, you know, working for a sports network a television network and their kind of sports stats and information sort of seeing that commitment is you know just when you're looking you know i mean i've, I've reviewed you know zillions of resumes uh over over the years of people and the ones that are actually showing that commitment that they've actually they've got that you know it's not it's not just about saying oh i've got a passion for you know the nfl or, or soccer or whatever right but actually seeing that they're acting on it and you know, kind of producing work, you know, the, the high quality work is great, but just the fact that they're kind of doing the work and getting the feedback and learning and hopefully evolving over time, you know, just speaks volumes as they're kind of interviewing for folks. So uh, I think I'll stop there and kind of open it up for questions. Hopefully we've talked about a few different topics between Maya and I that uh, are of interest, but I'm sure you have a few uh, uh, specific questions. And so, yeah, let's make it happen. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was amazing to hear about your journey. I think it's super interesting how both of you use your different STEM backgrounds and still ended up in working somewhere that's so interesting and you're still using those STEM skills today. Um, I think that's amazing. We're going to open it up for questions right now. So if any of you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll begin question and answers. I see one in there, um, Adiola, that's about uh, do you have any suggestions for the Canadian system? I'm not sure what exactly is meant by that. Is it more about the Canadian system of education or more for Canadian sports? I'm not sure. Yana, do you want to expand on that question? And while we wait for her, I do have a question for both of you. I think um, this is a question both you and Aaron can answer. Um, when did you first know you were interested in the STEM field and what advice would you give to our teachers to relate to their students about getting your foot in the door into the world of STEM without the traditional background or degree? I think this question is more towards you, Maya, because um, I know you have a degree in economics and English. Um, what would you give our, um, what advice would you give our teachers to let their students know if they don't have that typical um, traditional STEM background, what are some things that you feel like you can do to get your foot in the door and to STEM and get into um, a STEM career field? Yeah, I mean, I think it really, I think it really depends. Like, 
I guess it's, there's, it's twofold. Um, you know, one thing is I would say when you talk about STEM, that's such a huge category, like be, becoming, you know, a doctor and becoming a software engineer are two vastly different things and require sort of vastly different levels of education and um, have very different barriers to entry there. So I think, you know, maybe if, if your goal was to become, you know, something that required a great deal of niche technical expertise, um, that might be something that would be maybe more helpful to know when you're going through the college experience and, and kind of trying to figure out um, what you want to study. It, maybe is not, I'm not saying it's prohibitive if you don't study those things as an undergrad, but like it, it's a much easier path if you, you know, if your goal is to become a nuclear physicist or something for you to study physics as an undergrad is going to be a much easier path to getting there versus something I think like being, for example, I, I use this because it's a very um, common example, but to become a software engineer, I know loads of people who have studied something completely different and then you know, later on decided that that was, that that was maybe not something that they wanted to pursue anymore and wanted to pivot um, into, you know, more of a software um, space and were able to go back, either go back and do like a certification program or some sort of, um, you know, a nighttime education program or some, some sort of, you know, supplementary um, programming and, and actually get into those fields. So I think when you say STEM, I, I would maybe clarify within you know each kind of field what that looks like and then um, do a little bit of research just to see if you can find kind of paths of folks who have gone on to those careers um, just to see what the what the kind of typical path looks like and at what point you need to sort of make a go no go decision thank you um, I also have a question for Aaron but well, I can also riff a little bit on that sort of maybe give a you know almost at some level I've got two conflicting thoughts and some of which will maybe a little contrarian uh, to what Maya said there um, so the first is you know similar to the way I mentioned that data science kind of didn't exist when I um, first started, like, it's also just amazing what kinds of public free resources are out there now that didn't exist at all um, when I was in school. I, when, when I remember the first time I took a class on the Coursera um, website, right, like, you know, it's like, it felt like going to grad school for free. Um, so I would strongly encourage people that are really trying to um, break in but feel like they don't have that background to, um, you know, if they're really passionate about it, to try to use those resources. There's really, I mean, there, there are these boot camps and stuff, but there's amazing stuff, uh, especially for people that don't have the means to uh, pay for a boot camp. And, you know, not all those, I think, work out to be quite so cost effective when, when all is said and done. I would encourage students to, to do their research. Um, but there, if you are passionate about it, then um, I would, you know, strongly encourage you to try to take advantage of the free uh, resources out there before you. Um, you know, start to, to do a paid program. But then the opposite thing that I would say um, is like, I also think, again, the passion thing is important and you really gonna be passionate about like, you know, software engineering or medicine, right? Like it's one thing to say like, hey, I wanna grow up and be the team doctor. But if you find yourself pulling your hair out when you're taking anatomy class, like that could be, a, or you, you know, you, you, you're squeamish about blood as I probably would be, right? I mean, that, uh, you know, it's important to really kind of recognize that and be honest with yourself about what you really are excited about and what your strengths are um, and what your weaknesses are. Because, you know, again, as I said, the competition is incredibly difficult. And so like, I hate, I feel guilty saying this, but like sometimes you'll see people that are like applying for, um, you know, a software engineering job with the team. And again, they've done one of these kind of boot camp certification projects they are competing with people that have like a master's or a PhD in computer science from like a top tier um, kind of school. And so, you know, it can be really hard to compete with those folks. And then the other related point to that is that there's some of these jobs are becoming, the STEM aspect of it is just kind of ubiquitous. Um, the story I always like to tell is um, there was a, a an old basketball, had, he, he turned to be a head coach, but um, he, he sort of made his name as basically the very first video coordinator. And, um, you know, at the time, it was just crazy to watch games on film instead of go and scout in person. And, you know, over time, though, it became just part of the job. And now, like, everybody does it. Um, and the idea that you would, like, go to a conference for video coordinators about, you know, new techniques in film, just like it doesn't happen the way it does for kind of, um, you know, sports analytics. And so I often kind of categorize people 
um, working in sports analytics into sort of two buckets, you know, one of which is like the producers of uh, analytics. They're the ones that are writing the code, developing new formulas, things like that. And, you know, that, again, that's a very competitive thing. But it's also critically important just to be able to be an intelligent consumer of analytics. And so there's a lot of people, if you're not um, quite as strong as STEM today, you know, it's, you know, it's fine to be able to kind of go in a more general role with say a basketball or a football team, but be just really good about understanding what the stats are. And maybe you're not inventing new stats, maybe you're not writing code yourself, but you're great at kind of, you know, looking, using the tools to identify um, kind of insights from the numbers, right? And so I think that's something else that people can definitely do, you know, even if they don't love coding, for instance, right? So I, I would encourage people to think about that as well. Yeah, and I would maybe even just to bring it back to like a more broader um, point about like when you might need to make this decision about STEM and, and when you might want to make this transition into sports. I would say like, the as Aaron said, like positions in sports can be hard to come by and there's not a whole lot of them. Um, and so the other piece of advice I would say is like, you know, Aaron and I maybe got a little lucky that sports happened for us earlier on in our careers. Um, but I, but you know, there are so many examples of people who always had sports as kind of like a pipe dream or sort of a North Star as something they wanted to get into eventually. And just depending on what kind of vertical you're in. So if you're on the data science side, or if you're on, you know, the, to, like Aaron said, if you wanted to be a team doctor or a, or a, you know, a physical therapist for a team or whatever it is, um, you know, there's there's nothing wrong, and in fact, it's probably a much better experience if you start out doing those things outside of the sports realm, and then eventually kind of make your way into sports. Like, I don't think it has to be your first stop on your career to to work in sports. It can always be part of a longer term kind of career path, um, and so we just encourage a little bit of patience and um, you know, just thinking about it as you know, a, over the span of a long career. Um, sports can always fit in there at some point. It doesn't have to be the first or second or even third job you have. Yeah, and I would also say that reminds me, uh, I think people mythologize kind of working in sports and they don't appreciate that, you know, it's a job like any other. In fact, it's probably not a job like any other. Um, if you think about coaches yelling at players on the sideline, that probably doesn't happen at your place of business, uh, right? In your school, I imagine your principal's not calling you over and uh, coaching you up uh, in quite the same way. And so, uh, and that same kind of dynamic happens kind of off the field as well. Um, and people don't sort of understand that, you know, very often, I think it's probably less true in football, but very often these teams are a lot like a small business. Um, you know, maybe the NBA league office, I think is a little less so, um, but kind of working for a team, it was just a handful of people, you know, there's not a very well-developed system that really depends on the personality of your boss and their style. And, you know, we've all kind of read stories in the news uh, about some crazy things that happened. And so, you know, it's exciting. I'm, I'm very glad that I've had the opportunity to work for a team, but I also kind of, um, you know, I'm content, I think, with where I am and sort of not kind of, I always sort of used to joke about it. I wasn't really willing to move to NBA Siberia, whatever uh, city you thought that was, to uh, for a team. Because, you know, I also kind of, as I got older, had the perspective, um, you know, there's lots of other interesting ways to work in sports. And I've been fortunate to be staying in basketball this time, even though I'm no longer working for a team. Thank you guys for answering those questions and expanding on them. Um, I think there's one in the chat with Britannia. Are your projects at the NBA primarily dealing with budgets and or statistics? Erin, I can jump on this one and then I'll pass it over to you. Um, so I think the, the nice thing about having both Erin and me on this panel is that we are both coming at the sports realm from very different spaces. Um, and so my work is like broader corporate strategy, which is not inherently a STEM adjacent or STEM related field. Um, whereas Aaron, I think is coming at it more from the statistics and data science field, which is more kind of easily um, related to, to, to STEM education, I would say. Um, my work is, is pretty broad. Um, and so my role is basically to be kind of an in-house consultant for the NBA's business. So anything that comes up on the business side for the NBA, whether it's, you know, how do we grow our 
um, viewership on our games? How do we um, engage fans in new ways now that everybody's doing things on their phones and not really sitting down in front of the TV to watch a two and a half hour game? Um, or it might be something like, how do we grow our market share internationally? Like those are the kinds of kind of big picture problems or um, projects that that I work on, that my team works on, when there's big kind of priority things, like for example, our, our collective bargaining agreement that we're renegotiating with the players, that's something that we get pulled in on um, to support with and, and, and work with the relevant folks across the league office to make those things happen. So a lot of what I do is very project management um, focused, but then there's also a lot of parts of it that are very tactical and it almost involves like jumping in wherever is necessary to get things done. Like I'm sort of meant to be a jack of all trades to be able to like slot in wherever the project requires some expertise or some support um, and just jump in really, you know, cold, learn what's going on, get up to speed pretty quickly and then start contributing very quickly. Um, and so Tanya, to your question, um, you know, currently one of my big projects is very focused on our finances and, and focused on kind of looking at the longer term impacts to our financial health, to, to what this would, you know, implicate for our revenues and our expenses and things like that. Um, that's just a big part of one of the projects that I'm working on right now. But, you know, six months from now, I might be working on projects that are all focused on, you know, um, stakeholder management and making sure people are, um, you know, culturally aligned with what we're trying to do and creating change among the organization. So it could become very quote unquote soft skill focused in the future. Um, but right now what I'm working on just happens to be very kind of tactical and very um, like numerical, I guess um, is maybe the best way to put it. And it, hopefully that helps kind of clarify. It's just, a, it's, a, it's a very broad um, remit. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're you're more equipped to answer the second half of that about the statistics. Yeah, no, I would say you know in a lot of ways I've had you know some similar experiences to you. I found that some jobs I have have been uh, pretty broad, and then others like sometimes I'll be working on statistics for a while. But for instance, in my role right now with this athlete stock market, I've been you know doing career projections, and so that's been more statistics focused. But like an important part of it um, because it is sort of a stock market slash sports book. Um, you know, the budgeting and kind of tracking our, our profit and loss and how the um, predictions are doing, you know, is an essential part of it. But, you know, I too, I think of myself as sort of a, you know, renaissance man or whatever. Um, you know, I often joke that I'm like the world's worst mechanical engineer with a PhD uh, at Stanford, because even then my time was very um, interdisciplinary. I did some mechanical engineering, some electrical engineering, and some programming, which is uh, kind of part of why I, um, you know, sort of had this kind of varying career over time, but I mean, there definitely are people. One thing I think is very different about sort of people that came to sports uh, that are kind of of my age versus maybe Maya's is that um, now, you know, the classic thing, like people see that there are jobs out there. And so they specialize much more uh, earlier. I think they're trying to, you know, they're in freshman in college dreaming of working for, you know, a team for a league office. Um, something like that. Um, you know, the people that joined around the time when I did are a very um, wide range of backgrounds, um, you know, very eclectic. Bill James is kind of like the father of baseball, uh, sabermetrics, right, analytics. You know, he wrote his kind of first book as a sort of an overnight security guard, I believe, working uh, in uh, in Kansas. Um, and so he had a lot of time on his hand, and that's when he did his work. So, you know, now we've got people that are kind of pointing from day one. And so that's a little bit different, too. So I think, though, that there are tons of jobs in all these different areas, right? Even on an individual team, you know, again, there's people working on the, what's called the basketball operation side in the NBA, but then there's also the business operations, right? There's all kinds of people working in sales and advertising, and, you know, um, optimizing marketing spend and chief financial officer um, and doing the budgeting there. So, you know, depending on the situation, you know, there's a lot of different things that you can do. And I, yeah, and to that point, and I would also say like, I think as in, hopefully this is the point I was trying to make in my in my little spiel at the beginning, but like, I think a STEM education and a STEM degree are valuable regardless of what aspect of sports you are working in. Um, I think it's an industry that just values people who are hardworking, who are curious, who want to learn, um, who are scrappy, and who are smart. And so all of those things are true regardless of 
what you studied in, in undergrad um, or in grad school or PhD, whatever it is. So um, I would just say like the, you know, the, the, the STEM portion of this does not mean that you have to work in a more analytical data science stats yeah. part of the field, or it doesn't mean you have to go become part of the like medical staff of the of team. Yeah, uh, and not only that, but uh, that reminds me of a funny story uh, which sort of fits in with the question that you asked earlier. You know, some people that might not think of themselves as doing STEM or, you know, sometimes they're savants, right? Some people are, I remember one of the sort of like a general manager that I worked with, he had a, just an encyclopedic memory. He could like tell you some random story about a basket on a game in, you know, December, you know, eight years ago or something. And, you know, just sort of, I just could not keep up with all those details. And then <laughs> amusingly, I joined the 76ers. Um, you know, like a week or two after the season started. And the head coach at the time was Doug Collins, who co famously coached Michael Jordan. Was on, he was also on the 1972 uh, Olympic basketball team. And the reporters were asking him during training camp about um, kind of his interest in analytics. And he's like, oh man, if, you know, we hire someone that gives me like a 200 page report, you know, it's like, I probably shoot myself in the head or something. Some sort of very kind of dismissive comment about analytics. But then like, and so I was like a little wary when I took the job, but then when I actually talked to him a little bit and I didn't interact with him that much, but he knew all kinds of stats and he had like, you know, his guy who didn't even work for the team sending him stats. That was also part of why he was such an amazing uh, broadcaster. Um, so like he, he didn't realize that he was like way into the sort of same kinds of things that I was. Um, he was just used to doing it his own way. And so I think that, you know, sometimes people find that uh, a little off-putting, threatening, um, or just kind of, you know, they're not really ready for the change. And so uh, I think people, you know, it, it's, it's an important skill, right? Even if you're just looking at a box score um, during a timeout and really scanning it really quickly and seeing what kind of insight, you know, that doesn't, you know, require a, you know, a degree in uh, a STEM field. So I think that's partially something that people that are interested in sports and maybe don't feel like they have such a strong STEM background, they might be surprised at how much they do know. Um, in the sort of sports space, uh, the combination of sports and, and sort of math. Thank you guys for, thank you guys so much for being our speakers today and letting us hear about your journey, your experience and answering our question. Hopefully Aaron and Maya were able to answer any of the questions you guys have. Um, I will be sending out more information, follow-up details, and um, you could relay any more questions you have to me after the event. Um, right now we're gonna wrap up this session. Um, I made a few suggestions on how you guys can team up um, with your students to increase engagement. I think STEM and sports is a really fun way to, that can be interpreted into your classroom curriculum. And a few great activities, I think Aaron was also mentioning a few things earlier, um, with your students is learning how active play correlates with burning calories, discovering the technology behind optimal serving speed, teaching your students how to calculate their own field goal percentage, just like the greatest players in the NBA, and also teaching students to understand energy and motion differences with basketballs, footballs, baseballs, et cetera. I think these are all great ways that, um, great activities that you can implement into your classroom curriculum to really um, get those students who are interested in sports and STEM, it's a fun way to increase their engagement in STEM. And there's lots of research that shows that um, sports, students who are engaged in sports show a significant improvement in science and math whenever um, those activities are incorporated into the classroom. I want to thank um, Aaron and Maya once again for joining us and all of you teachers for logging on to our first virtual event. I hope you really um, gain something valuable and are able to um, relate something back to your students. That is very important. Um, the teacher enrichment program's major sponsors include Akamai Foundation, Cogmore Foundation, Equitrans, Lockheed Martin, the May Family Foundation, TC Energy, and Vulcan Materials. Thank you guys so much for joining. I've also included the QR code for our next virtual event coming up on February 7th. This is a college and career panel that is going to be a theme of information technology and computer skills. I hope you all enjoyed our first webinar and have a great night.